Good evening, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, we're really happy to have you here for this special lecture that has been organized by the Asiatic Society because uh, Mr. John Malcolm, who has written this book, is passing through Mumbai, and we are very happy that he accepted our invitation. May I invite uh, Mr. Malcolm and our president, who's, uh, Mr. Sharad Kale, who's going to be chairing the session, to kindly take their place at the table. our speaker for the day. Um, John Malcolm is a kinsman of Sir John Malcolm, who, as you know, was uh, governor of Mumbai, and also of Mount Stuart Elphinstone, both governors of Bombay in the 1820s. He graduated in history from the University of Cambridge in 1957. And thereafter, for 14 years, he worked for Royal Dutch Shell, serving in Malaysia, East Africa, Yemen, London, and Iran. Since 1972, he has worked in Australia for various companies in international business, latterly with Telstra, the Australian Telecommunications Corporation, supervising operations in Indochina, and several countries of the former Soviet Union. He has extensive knowledge of the Middle East and Asia, and since retirement, he has been free to pursue his interest, or should I say his passion, in the life and times of Sir John Malcolm. His biography of Malcolm, Malcolm, soldier, diplomat, ideologue of British India, which we have here, and you can look at it later perhaps, um, was published in 2014. So we welcome you here today, Mr. Malcolm, and uh, I think our president would like to meet you something small. two Scotsmen in Western India. Um, I think when you came into this building, you could, probably couldn't avoid noticing the enormous statue of a very tall man, actually the same height as myself, um, <laughs> Sir John Malcolm, and also a slightly smaller one of Mount Stuart Elphinstone. <clears throat> these, two, these are the two Scotsmen in Western India about whom I want to talk this afternoon. These are the two Scotsmen in Western India about whom I want to talk this afternoon, and both of them, incidentally, as you've already heard, a kinsman of mine. <clears throat> There's a story behind that statue out there, in that when Sir John Malcolm retired as governor of Bombay in 1830, the citizens got together to raise funds to have a statue made of him, and they hired the foremost British sculptor, Sir Francis Chantry, to do the job. 
for the tidy sum of £2,300, which I think is about two crores today, so there's no small amount of money put in. <clears throat> and um, oddly enough, he himself had already opened this town hall uh, earlier that same year, calling it the most magnificent structure that taste and munificence have as yet erected in India. <clears throat> Three years later, Malcolm died in London, and all the assembled grandees decided that they should put up some sort of statue of him in Westminster Abbey. And um, when they met for a fundraising gathering, um, Malcolm's cousin, who was called William Paisley, was a frugal Scot, and he told the assembled party that um, he could actually get them a statue for a cut price, because what he would do is use uh, Francis Chartres' um, <coughs> model, plaster, plaster model, and just copy it. So the fact is that today, the statue you see there is the original, and the one that you might see at Westminster Abbey is just a cheap copy. <coughs> I'm, um, I'm reluctant to get into Indian political history, but because my two Scotsmen were so heavily involved in Indian politics of their day, I feel I must briefly set out the political background for the period when they were in India. And this was roughly the, the half century of 1783 to 1833, <clears throat> it, during which time, of course, the East India Company established its hegemony over most of the subcontinent. The extraordinary feature of this period was that there was no concerted strategic plan coming out of London to achieve this. The court of directors of the East India Company <coughs> opposed practically all proposals put up by governors general during this period for acquisition of territorial land. <coughs> because for them, um, territorial acquisitions usually involved wars, and wars have terrible negative cash flows. The British government, on the other hand, was simply not interested in India. This is the thing which I think a lot of people in this subcontinent are not aware of, is that they didn't care about India. They, their main interest was in, for overseas expansion was in North America and West Indies. And you'll see that in, in documents by the thousand that that is the case. <clears throat> now the key British political figure in this period was Richard Wellesley, Marcus Wellesley, who was Governor General from 1797 to 1805. He was just about the only Briton who did have a strategic plan. It was he who had the clarity of vision to see that the chaotic state of the subcontinent at that time, that's 1797, could probably only be cured by having a single controlling power. And that of the various candidates in the south, Tipper Sultan of Mysore, in the west, the Marathas, in the north, the remnants of the <coughs> Mughal Empire, and in Bengal, the company, without posts in Madras and Bombay. Only the company had the will, the discipline, and above all, the necessary wherewithal to succeed. And from the date of his arrival, Wellesley set out to do so with breathtaking audacity, and moreover, against the explicit wishes of his two employers in London. The company and the British government were just not with him on this. He, he, he acted alone. And seven years later, when he was within sight of achieving this rather astonishing aim, he was recalled, and when he got back to Britain, very nearly impeached. His project was put on hold, but it, 12 years later, it was reluctantly uh, res resumed, and by 1818, largely achieved. Wellesley is mostly forgotten today, but his imperial achievement, whether you like it or not, can reasonably be compared to that of his contemporary, Napoleon Bonaparte. 
Napoleon's career of conquest was spectacular, but within his own lifetime, it ended in defeat and humiliation for France. For Wellesley, for better or for worse, it lasted for 140 years. Malcolm and Alpinstone both worked for Richard Wellesley, although they didn't always see eye to eye with him. But they also worked with his younger brother, Arthur Wellesley, later the Duke of Wellington. In fact, Wellington and Malcolm became lifelong friends. Some would say they were best friends. <coughs> now, let me, oops, back to, sorry. Um, back to Malcolm, that's what, well, Elvinstone. Um, let me brief summarize Malcolm's life and career. Of course, one can only just skate over it this afternoon. Born in Scotland in 1769 in the Scottish border country, he was the seventh of 17 children of the same mother. Uh, she was appropriately named Bonnie Peggy. His father was a tenant farmer, the son of a minister in the Church of Scotland. Now, Bonnie Peggy was a remarkable woman. Apart from producing 17 children in over 21 years, all of them, I may say, surviving childbirth, she still found time to produce two recipe books, <laughs> which uh, incidentally included curry recipes from, back from India by some of her sons. I suppose if you have 19 children, a 19 family sitting down to breakfast each morning, you, you probably acquire some catering skills. <coughs> and she also believed in tough love. Uh, when one of her sons, aged 13, and already a midshipman at sea, complained, wrote a letter to her complaining about a stiff neck, she replied, the Almighty can protect you as well at, at sea as on land. Put your trust in him. Fear God and keep his commandments. And my dear boy, you have no other fear. I hope you will have no more wry necks and loom limbs, but be a brave, stout fellow. <laughs> that's, um, that's her line. Um, anyway, back to Malcolm. <coughs> in 1781, when he was just 12, his father went bankrupt. And the 10 sons had to be sent out to work. <coughs> he was lucky enough to get the, the support of, of the local lad and got a commission in the Madras army. And he arrived in Madras in 1783, not quite 14. Now, his career in India spanned 47 years, although nine of them were spent back in Britain. He was a quintessential all-rounder and excelled in many fields. As a soldier, in 1834, he campaigned with Arthur Wellesley in southern and western India, where he, he in effect, worked in partnership with Wellesley. Wellesley was the general, he was the diplomat. In 1817, as a major general, <coughs> he led the company troops to victory over Maharaja Holkar, as a battle of Medipur. As an administrator, in 1818-1821, he pacified Central India, which they called it then, basically Madhya Pradesh today. <clears throat> and from, of course, 1827 to 1830, he was governor of Bombay. As a diplomat, he acted as private secretary and general troubleshooter to Richard Wellesley. And between 1800 and 1810, he led three company missions to Persia. As a scholar, he was fluent in several languages and wrote nine influential books, including his monumental history of Persia, which became the standard work on the subject in a Western language for nearly a century. He was also an expert on Arab horses and an enthusiastic amateur poet with some really excruciating lines, which I won't, uh, I'll spare you. <clears throat> now let's quickly run through Elphinstone. Oh, there you go, okay, Elphinstone, there he is. Um, <clears throat> 10 years younger than Malcolm, he came from an entirely different family background. 
If Malcolm was what one might call a thruster, which is meritocratic, ambitious, up from lower levels, <coughs> Elphinstone was definitely a cruster. He was upper class, old money. He was born the youngest son of an aristocratic Scottish family, still prominent to this day. He was educated privately in Scotland and then London. <coughs> and um, he arrived in India in, in 1796, age 16. <coughs> you might um, perhaps wonder why a nicely brought up son of a Scottish aristocrat, would, what he'd make of India, especially of the Maratha chiefs with their killers and their intrigues and their marauding bands of tribesmen. But of course, it was quite familiar territory to a Scot. Castles, clan feuds, court intrigues were the stuff of Scottish history. And for instance, in 1566, Elphinstone's ancestor, and incidentally mine too, was the third Lord Riven. He was a co-conspirator with Lord Darnley when they murdered David Rizzio, who was Mary Queen of Scots, Italian secretary and favourite, in her presence at Holyrood Palace in Edinburgh. Riven had risen from his sickbed to join other Protestant nobles in this attack on someone foreign, Catholic, and gay, and perhaps an early Eurosceptical gesture. <laughs> Exhausted after a few cup stabs, he, um, he sat down and apologized to the Queen, who, by the way, was six months pregnant, for sitting down in her presence. And when he had a little rest, he got up and had a few more stabs to finish him off. Anyway, um, his son, um, Ribbon's son that is, uh, actually kidnapped the young king and held him prisoner. This was, this was about 17 years later. He held him prisoner for a year while the Ribbons effectively ran Scotland. Um, nemesis came to them in the end, but that's, that's another story. Anyway, you know, he was quite up to things in the Maratha country. <coughs> He was on arrival in India, he was first sent to Benares and later transferred to, to, to Pune. He kept voluminous and candid diaries all his adult life in rather spidery handwriting, and they're all today in the British Library. <coughs> There's an entry in 1801 listing the books which he'd read in the previous 12 months. I'd love to have shown you the whole lot, the whole list. The trouble is, it's just too long. There were 70 items, as he called it, one each line. Uh, some of them describing not one book, but several in a variety of languages. The European languages, English, Latin, Greek, I suppose European, Persian, yes, Italian, Arabic, and two or three Indian languages. Um, the first item on this list was a good deal of the history relating to the East, which is, covers rather a lot in itself, I would have thought. Another item mentions quite casually, I translated with Strachey a considerable part of an Arabic grammar. And the last item was, and novels innumerable, as if we didn't have enough to read already. Uh, his erudition was frightening. Um, during the anglo Maratha War in 1803, Elphinstone, although he was a civilian, was at attached to, to Arthur Wellesley, Arthur Wellesley's army, you could say, and took back part in the Battle of Assay. He later became resident in Nagpur, and in 1808, the Governor General sent him on a, on a mission to Afghanistan. He only got as far as Peshawar, but he made a very good impression, and he, he, he came back from that, and in 1811, he got his chance when he was promoted to become the resident in Pune at the court of Baji Rao II. Um, and of course, as you would know, Baji Rao is the, uh, the paramount chief of the Marathas at that time. 
And his relationship with Bhaji Rao, which he uh, became more and more strained. And in 1817, it, 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 uh, it burst out in what became the last anglo maratha War. <clears throat> and um, <clears throat> after the defeat and exile of the Peshwa, Elphinstone was appointed commissioner for the Delta, for the Deccan, which is, of course, the whole of Maharashtra, minus Bombay. <clears throat> and then in 1819, he became the governor of Bombay, which I'm sure you all know. And he, he did that job for eight years and then handed over to Malcolm in 1827 and returned to England to lead the life of a country gentleman for the next 30 years. He twice refused the offer of governor general because he didn't feel his health was up to it. But he did write a history of India, and he remained a bachelor all his life. Now, let me introduce a third Scotsman in Western India, whom I'm sure most of you already know, namely Sir James Mackintosh, nicknamed Old Toffee. <coughs> He's a truly extraordinary man. He was born in Scotland in 1765, read medicine at Edinburgh University, then moved to London. He was too interested in politics to stick to medicine, and he became an enthusiastic Whig politician. He made friends with Charles James Fox and the playwright Sheridan. And in 1791, he published a tract supporting the French Revolution in answer to Burke's uh, anti-revolution, -re reflections on the French Revolution. Um, <clears throat> and um, together with Thomas Paine's Rights of Man, it was a bestseller. And not long afterwards, he was disillusioned with the revolution's excesses, and he became an ardent admirer of Burke. And he also became a journalist. And then he studied law, called to the bar in 1796, became a highly successful <coughs> barrister and man about town. Brilliant, disorganized, extravagant. In 1804, he was rather surprisingly appointed re recorder, which is chief judge of Bombay. He claimed that he accepted the post to gain more time for writing, but more probably it was because he'd run out of money. Finding on arrival for this fellow with his sort of uh, breadth of vision, a tiny and rather provincial Anglo-Indian society, he may have felt like a caged lion in an intellectual desert. And so what did he do? He, he, he formed the Literary Society of Bombay, which is the predecessor, of course, of your Asiatic Society. Both Elphinstone and Malcolm became enthusiastic supporters and both later became presidents of the society and lectured to it. I recall that uh, Malcolm, in I think 1821, he gave a, he gave a lecture on the Beel tribes in central India. As an appointee of the Crown, and therefore independent of <coughs> East India Company administrators, Macintosh was um, in a position to say more or less what he liked about them. Um, and he once remarked that every Englishman who resides here for very long has, I fear, either his mind emasculated by submission or corrupted by despotic power. Mr. Duncan, that's Jonathan Duncan, who was the governor of Bombay at the time, may represent one genus, the Brahmanized Englishman. Lord Wellesley is indisputably at the head of the other, the Sultanized Englishman. In April 1880, Malcolm arrived in Bombay with his newly wedded and very pregnant wife on his way to his second Persian mission. He'd previously met Macintosh in Mysore, and the two men had got along very well. Malcolm being awe inspired, of course, by Macintosh's vast erudition, and Macintosh by Malcolm's active mind and raw literary talent. The Macintoshes and their five daughters were staying at Parel, the governor's country residence, um, because Governor Duncan was a bachelor and didn't need such a large house. Anyway, the Macintoshes took in the Malcolms at Parel for a while, while they looked for a house. 
and they found one at a place which is, was called Nom Pere. It's in the vicinity of today's Kemp's Corner. I haven't been able to pin it right down, but that's roughly where it was. Um, and the Macintoshes moved to another house quite called Tarala, Tarala, I think, which apparently survived until 1929. Uh, incidentally, many of these British Indian uh, military men um, with their families camped more or less semi-permanently in tents on what is now the Maidan. And Malcolm may, may also have had a tent on the Maidan. <coughs> in, 18, in late 1810, uh, Malcolm returned to Bombay from his third and last Persian mission. He then received permission from the Governor General to take a year's paid leave and to sort out his papers and write up a memoir on Persia, which nobody knew much about at that time. He'd already written two books, one an account of the Sikhs following his military service in the Punjab in 1805, another an account of a mutiny of British officers at, 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 uh, in, the, in the Madras army in 1809. Mackintosh now became his mentor and, and in his much more ambitious attempt to write a history of Persia. Mackintosh kept a diary during the year 1811 with some illuminating entries. Both he and Malcolm were due to return to England at the end of that year. Mackintosh on completion of his assignment and Malcolm on leave, long last after 25 years of service. Um, at first, Macintosh was keen to go on the same ship with Malcolm, but later he had second thoughts, and in his diary he wrote, Malcolm wishes we should travel together. Since I have sat at the breakfast table, I have been struck by his true Scottish mode of dressing and eating, his nails, his spluttering, and his use of the napkin. So, that was off. Um, in February of that year, Elphinstone came, arrived in Bombay from Calcutta on his way to Pune to take up his job as resident. And Macintosh wrote, In the morning, Mr. Elphinstone, just landed, came in with General Malcolm, at whose house he is. He has somewhat of the calm, rational manner and awkward appearance of a Scotchman. He is red-haired and high cheekbone. Soon afterwards, Malcolm rode up to Pona to stay for a few weeks with Elphinstone. They both loved hunting and spent most of the day chasing wild boar. In the evenings, they discussed their recent travels in Persia and Afghanistan. But Elphinstone had already made a report in his Afghan mission, but it was only when he visited Bombay and came under Macintosh's influence that he was persuaded, in turn, uh, to, to make his report into a publishable book, which was called The Kingdom of Kobol. Mackintosh continued with the comment on Malcolm. In correcting a manuscript of Malcolm's, I observed that when a man of vigorous mind conceives original ideas, he often expresses them in such a manner that they appear to be commonplace. This is one reason why men of great talent for active life are inferior to themselves in their writings. All through that year, 1811, Malcolm worked on his history of Persia, but he was destined to take three more years of continuous work while on leave back in England before publishing the book in June, 1815. At the end of June, just after the Battle of Waterloo, came the even more pleasing news, because it pleasing, first pleasing news was that it was a great success from day one. <coughs> the second pleasing news was an invitation from the Duke of Wellington, his great friend from Indian days, to come and stay with him in Paris. Uh, what could be, have been more exciting for an author than to go to Paris at this time, when his host was the victor of Waterloo and the hero of all Europe? and where he would meet all the crowned heads of Europe and the savants of French intellectual society, all excited about his book. He stayed there for two wonderful months, and again he's written, written this up in a day-by-day -day diary. 
when you think of it, all this for a boy who left his one-room school um, in Scotland at the age of 12. There it is. That's still, still, still at stand. In um, mid-1817, Malcolm returned to India from his leave, and he was immediately given a, a special assignment by the Governor-General to visit the various Maratha chiefs and seek their cooperation in eradicating the scourge of the Pindari uh, bandits, freebooters, whatever you like to call them, and many of them who had incidentally been hired by the Maratha chiefs themselves to plunder their neighbor's territory. Um, near Pune, he met Baji Rao, who told him that he'd support his plan. Malcolm was happy, but Elphinstone, who, who was also in Pune at the time, had never trusted Baji Rao, and he was proved right. Baji Rao had in fact been plotting with other chiefs for over a year to attack the British. In November 1817, Baji Rao's army marched against the company's garrison and Pune. Elphinstone had to abandon his residency at the Sangam and retire to the top of the nearby hill at Kirki. From there, he saw the Peshwa's troops arriving at his residency and setting fire to him, destroying all his records and most of his precious books, although he might have, he might have taken his copy of Natty's Inferno with him if he'd got it by then, because ten years later he bequeathed it guess who, to the Asiatic Society in Bombay. Elphinstone described the subsequent battle of Kirki, where 3,000 company troops were attacked by 30,000 of the Peshwa's cavalry in his diary, in this spindly handwriting. The sight, and I, uh, this is great prose to me, the sight was magnificent as the tide of cavalry rolled out of Pune. Everything was hushed except the trampling and neighing of horses, and the whole valley was filled with them like a river in flood. This whole mass of cavalry came on at speed in the most splendid style. The rush of horse, the sound of the earth, the waving of flags, the brandishing of spears were ground beyond description, but perfectly ineffectual. <clears throat> After his defeat at Kirki, Baji Rao was on the run, pursued by company armies for the, for the next six months. He turned north towards central India <coughs> with his depleted army, hoping to get help from Holkar. But at the end of December, Holkar was defeated by Malcolm at the Battle of Medipur. Baji Rao felt that if he had to surrender, he would if possible surrender to Malcolm, whom he described as his last friend among the English. This, this duly happened in June 1818 at a village about 10 miles west of Asagar, which, as you can see, is an almost impregnable fortress. <clears throat> Malcolm offered Baji Rao uh, surprisingly decent terms. He could be exiled to, to Bitu, which is near Kodpur, and a large, a large pension of 8 lakhs a year life, his life. The deal was accepted, but uh, it was much criticized by the public, the, the civil servants in Calcutta, who said, well, why offer so much to a man who's now powerless and who's had also been so personally treacherous to Malcolm himself? Malcolm may also have calculated that with the Peshwa's, quote, feeble constitution and debauched habits, he surely wouldn't last long. But I think in the end, Baji Rao had the last laugh on this because he lasted another 33 years. In the end, though, Malcolm's generosity was justified. Abiding peace was achieved with the Marathas. The result was that in June 1818, the company suddenly found itself unexpectedly in effective military control of the territories of the entire Maratha Empire. It had to think out more or less on the run, a system of civil government. As Horace Walpole had said many years earlier, it was easier to conquer the East than to know what to do with it. 
As you have seen, Elvinstone is made Commissioner for the Deccan, governing the newly acquired Mar Maharashtra territories, and then in 1819 appointed Governor of Bombay. Actually, Malcolm had, accepted, had expected to get the job, but was uh, unpopular and with some of the directors back in London and was vetoed. Malcolm was left to pacify and redevelop Central India, an area which had been wrecked, wrecked by uh, wrecked, wrecked, sorry, wrecked by, by civil strife for some 30 years. Malcolm worked very closely with Holker's former chief minister, Tantia John, and achieved dramatic results, which he later recorded in a book, Memoir of Central India. There's a story behind this picture in that um, originally, uh, the original picture was a picture of Malcolm with his left hand on an occasional table to the left there. And the Kibbe family, who, who Tantra John was part of, they thought they'd like to put Kibbe in an advantageous position. So they overpainted Kibbe uh, uh, <laughs> next door. And you can see Malcolm is six foot five and Kibbe is probably in reality about five foot three. And he's made to look just a little shorter than Malcolm. Uh, the other thing that, that occurred to me when looking at that picture was that um, while um, in India, it's better right for two fellows to be holding hands. In Anglo-Saxon society, it definitely <laughs> isn't. And um, I think that Malcolm is rather in, 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 not very precise picture, but he's got a look in his face which tells me that if, if that was in the private eye magazine, there'd be a balloon going up saying, I hope the press doesn't get hold of this. But um, anyway, uh, <clears throat> so for both, both of these chaps, constraints were considerable. The company had a well-trained army, but it was largely a sepoy army, and of course it had to be treated quite carefully. Uh, <clears throat> there was no company police force at all, and a great lack of trained British civil administrators. Elphinstone had six civilian assistants to cover the whole, that's British civil assistants, to cover the whole of Maharashtra. <clears throat> and to act as residents at native courts in central India, Malcolm had to rely on army officers who had virtually no experience of governance. So as governors, they had to rely overwhelmingly on the support of the governors. But amazingly, this decade, they managed to maintain peace, largely by working through existing systems rather than trying to impose new ones. In 1822, Malcolm went back to Britain, but in 1827 he returned to India this, for the last time to take over as governor of Bombay from Elphinstone. Elphinstone now, <coughs> now went slowly home. He, he took a whole year to do it, and he went by around most of the continent of Europe going to Greece, Rome, and so on, but these places he'd written and read about. And um, he eventually got to Scotland, and um, I'd like to read you, again, I, as you can see, I'm rather mesmerized by Elphinstone's prose. This is coming back to his ancestral house in Scotland. Um, he left, which he'd left at the age of 16, he was going back at the age of 48, having been 32 years in India continuously. And this is how he describes it again in this diary, in his handwriting. The wild cherry tree where the swing was, the two larches now misshapen and old, the holly and the horse chestnuts are just as they formerly were. The yew tree is gone, but the lime tree stands though far less stately than I remember it. On entering the house, the smallness of the vestibule and the staircase astonished me. They were quite unaltered, not only for the paintings, but in the clock, the moose deer's heads, and even the ostrich's eggs. The smallness of the rooms, the homely appearance of the wainscot, struck me most. The deepest impression was made to me in my mother's bedroom, I saw in full perfection those earliest and dearest haunts of my childhood, 
and enjoyed what I shall never see again, the recollection of the days of my father and mother, unmixed with more recent associations. Malcolm now was um, back in Bombay. Uh, he was now 58 years old, which in those days was quite old. <coughs> He'd had a very smooth takeover from Elphinstone because they essentially agreed on practically everything. <coughs> and despite Malcolm being old, he believed that a governor should get around the presidency. And within a few weeks, he, he went up to Pune, and there he came upon a house and 60 acres at Dupuri, which is in the northwestern suburb of Pune now. And he bought it on the spot for 40,000 rupees. He turned the existing house, we know this, yes, he turned the existing house into a secretariat building and built a modest house for himself, which remained the Deccan government house until 1865 when he was replaced by Sir Bartle Frere <coughs> with a much more grandiose building in Ganesh Kind, and it's now the, the center, central building in Pune University. And Malcolm, with a typically imaginative flourish, turned the remainder of the property, and that's the, another 50 acres or so, into a botanical garden and experimental farm to investigate the practicality of growing cotton and coffee and mulberry trees for silk. I've got one little, nice little story about this house that uh, one of Malcolm's um, successors was Sir Robert Grant. Sir Robert Grant was a very pious man, and in fact he wrote hymns, and uh, those of you who Christians might know the one who worshipped the king or the above. Uh, anyway, Grant, uh, died when he was there, and um, uh, shortly after he died, a cat was seen leading the house, and that got people in a bit of a flurry because they wondered whether perhaps the cat had made off with Sir Robert Grant's soul. <laughs> and um, so the word went out, the order went out that whenever a sentry saw a cat passing by, present arms. <laughs> and this apparently lasted until 1865. Um, anyway, Malcolm moved on to visit Raja Pratap Singh at, at uh, Satara, uh, you know, the descendant of Sri Shivaji. And he then climbed the hills to Mahabaleshwar, which didn't exist as a hill station or anything then, where he set up a sanatorium for sick officers. And because he kept visiting the place and set up a house for himself there, um, it gradually, it very quickly became a hill station. And the great thing about the hill station was that you could, you could, if you went up there, you could get the governor's ear on an informal sort of basis and perhaps get through whatever you wanted. <coughs> In fact, Malcolm enjoyed the Deccan so much and found the heat of Bombay so oppressive that in his period as governor, he spent no more than a quarter of his time here. The rest was spent partly in Pune de Puri and partly uh, in Mahabaleshwar and partly wandering around the state, particularly in Gujarat in 1829-30. <clears throat> the most notorious episode in Malcolm's governorship, at least to contemporaries, was the quarrel between the Gombe government and the judges of the Supreme Court. The court had been set up in 1823, replacing uh, Macintosh's recorder's court, um, and it, like Macintosh's court, it reported directly back to London. Um, and um, in the Deccan, Elphinstone had tried to adhere as far as possible to the Peshwa's legal system. But the judges of this new Supreme Court um, felt that they, now that this was part of British territory, their rich had covered the whole of the Deccan as well. Um, Elphinstone managed to procrastinate for two or three years. Malcolm considered that such British legal concepts as habeas corpus and so on would be completely lost on the native population of the Deccan. And that the proposed extension of jurisdiction would be 
hopelessly impractical. But the three judges took umbrage at this. Then one of them died. Then a second one died shortly afterwards. And the third one was a man called Sir John Grant, who was also a Scot. He had only just arrived at Bombay. And he took it upon himself. He felt he better be loyal to his two deceased colleagues. And he fought against Malcolm, the government. He closed the court and he sent an appeal to the Privy Council back in London to back him up. And, uh, Malcolm then sent a, a fighting appeal uh, opposing this. And he wrote to his wife, I won't remain awake to have my government trampled upon, not by honest fellows with glittering sabres, but by quibbling, quill-driving lawyers. The Privy Council eventually, it took nearly a year for the information to get to London, be sorted out there and come back again, came down in Malcolm's favour, uh, which is not surprising because the Duke of Wellington happened to be the Prime Minister at the time. And Grant, while remaining defiant at the end, had to move to Calcutta. But by this time, he'd become a hero to the legal profession in Bombay, and he remains so to this day. There's a vast portrait of him in the foyer of the Bombay High Court, if you go there. Um, Malcolm made light of the whole distressing affair, writing a 69 doggerel poem the lawyers lament, lament, sorry, which went again. First verse goes, to the east a judge came, Johnny Grant was his name. In Scotland he is called Rothimurcus, that is where he came from. Though to India quite new, too, sorry, to, to, to India quite raw, yet full of his law, he determined to work us. And it ended, thus Scotch Johnnies in quarrel have reduced to thin gruel. Men used to have plenty in store. They tremble likewise, lest clients grow wise, should employ us poor lawyers no more. Um, now, <clears throat> the, late in um, Malcolm's governorship, he presided over something I experienced this morning coming down from Pune. Uh, at the opening of the Borgat Road, to wheel vehicles, apparently for the first time. So it meant that the Konkan and the Deccan were linked he, by, by wheel vehicles for, the, for that first time. And actually you, can, you, actually, you can still see the plaque which was put up, and it's, it remains there. And it's about a um, 43 kilometer mark um, on the road up the hill next door, on the left, under an under, underpass. <clears throat> Another event in Malcolm's governorship was the founding of the Indian Navy. The East India Company had set up the Bombay Marine in the 18th century to protect its merchant ships from pirates in the Indian Ocean and from occasional attacks by the Maratha Navy. By the 1820s, it was felt that there should be a company navy to, uh, to add to the company army. So in 1829, the Bombay Marine became the Indian Navy. And its first superintendent was none other than Sir, Sir John Malcolm's youngest brother, Admiral Sir Charles Malcolm. <coughs> Charles had his strengths and weaknesses, but his most useful contribution to history, as far as I'm concerned, was that he faithfully kept a daily diary throughout his nearly 11 years in Bombay, giving us a wonderful account of daily life in that small Anglo-Indian community. Um, if you bear it, I'd just like to quote one particular item um, in one day about a subject which I think you probably mostly know all about, which is the Parsi Revolt. Um, this is, this is his take on that particular thing. Let's see where it is. Um, and, uh, sorry, yeah. Oh, here, yes. Um, Pariah Dogs, Sunday the 10th of June, 1832. This week has been unique in the annals of the, this island. 
by a regular, well-organized sedition against government to make them rescind their order against killing that pestilential nuisance, the pariah dogs. It broke out on Thursday morning by a general shutting of shops and, 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 and markets, strong gangs being dis dis distributed to break and destroy all